This is Lindsay O'Donnell Welch with Decipher. I'm here today with Ben Nahorny, the threat intelligence analyst with Cisco, and we're going to talk about Cisco's recent cyber threat trends report from Trojan takeovers to ransomware roulette. Ben, thanks so much for joining me today. How's it going? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. Appreciate being on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. It, I was just reading over this report. There were a lot of really cool takeaways, and it all stemmed from looking specifically at DNS data, and you know that can tell us a lot about the prevalent threats out there and kind of how they work. Tell me a little bit about this report and the actual act of putting it all together. Sure. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting angle to, to look at within stuff on the threat landscape um, when we're looking at DNS-related activity, because when you think about how a lot of threats work in the modern era. You've got everything kind of connecting out to the internet um, from anything from a backdoor to info stealers, exfiltrating data. Um, essentially, they, they all need internet related connectivity to, to carry out their malicious activity. So DNS activity is a great area to look at when it comes to seeing um, how active certain threats are um, and seeing what's actually happening in the, the threat landscape. Um, so yeah, what we ended up doing with this report was taking a look at that data uh, that we're seeing from the DNS side of things. Um, and we have um, a, a lot of DNS security related um, uh, features and, and tools out there that, that uh, within Cisco. Um, some of those biggest ones to talk about, two products would be uh, Umbrella, um, Cisco Umbrella, and uh, Cisco Secure Access, both of which monitor DNS related activity. Uh, and offer a lot of functionality around blocking malicious threats. So we see lots and lots of DNS activity through um, within Cisco. Uh, and so much so, we, we look at an average of around 715 uh, billion um, DNS requests a day. So within that, we're, we're looking at all the malicious activity that's there. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, and so essentially, we're able to classify a lot of this uh, activity into various categories. Um, and that's what we looked at in the threat uh, report that we released. Uh, it's, a, it's a variety of, of stuff ranging from seeing info stealer activity, uh, ransomwares, Trojan, um, backdoors, uh, APTs, all sorts of different things. Um, and then we looked to see what sort of activity was um, the most prevalent. Some of that can be very noisy um, you know, being DNS related, but it shows you the the proportion of traffic that we're seeing for all these different threats. Yeah. How do you even begin to approach that data and how you kind of look out for some of those patterns that you're talking about? It's so much data there, and I'm sure that there are different specific characteristics that you need to kind of look at. How do you even start to do that? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's just a mountain of data. So we, we want to make this or take all this data and put it in some form that's digestible for the average reader or the average security person or just anyone that might be interested in this, this sort of uh, information. So ultimately, what we kind of have done is we take all these uh, things that we know are blocked um, and known blocked um, websites that we know are malicious. Um, and these have been classified by Umbrella and by Secure Access into these different categories. So starting from there, um, you're still talking about, you know, millions and millions of of blocks, basically. Um, so a way that we thought would be kind of nice to put that into something that's that's understandable is we averaged out the uh, monthly activity uh, over a time frame. So what we're actually looking at in this report is data starting in August of 2023 through March of 2024. And so then we basically averaged that out for each month, get, or we took a look at each month rather, and got an average over that time frame by month. Um, and use that as a basis to start looking at this activity based on each one of these categories. So then taking that, we, when you have an average for uh, uh, an average for the time frame, I should say, we're able to then compare each month. Uh, and so what we did is we looked to see whether um, a particular month was above average compared to the average for the whole time period or below average. And then that kind of teases out a trend that we can look at and examine to see uh, ultimately, if activity is increasing or decreasing over the time frame that we looked at. Yeah, that's a great way to approach it because then you can see, you know, month by month, but then also if there is a broader change like you're talking about, then that's something that you can also kind of discern through that data. Um, I'm curious too, because the report looks at 
different, you know, it looks like ransomware, backdoors, like APT activity. How did you first sit down and kind of say, here's the different types of um, threat categories that we need to create? And then how did you look at the different clues of each kind of sort of activity and how it would fall into each category, if that makes sense? Well, fortunately, a lot of this is actually done behind the scenes. So if, if someone is actually using something like Cisco Umbrella or Cisco Secure Access, uh, they can actually look at their own uh, information themselves and, and their own, um, I guess, malicious blocks, if you will, um, and, and actually categorize these within the product. So we're actually taking these out of uh, the product itself, these, these threat uh, categories that we have, um, and looking at those in particular. Um, but but they're they're largely automated as far as how the, they're they're actually um, detected um, and classified. Now some of that is is interesting uh, in the senses that you get into um, you know threat actors may be be using particular domains that are brand new. Um, those would be generally flagged by Umbrella right away. Say one customer sees something, um, then ultimately it's if it's say like twenty four hours old. It goes. Wait a minute. That's a very new domain. Maybe there's this. This could be a little strange for it suddenly popping up in a whole bunch of, of messages or say emails, for instance. Um, it, it'll flag that as a new domain. Then there's some backend work that's done to look more carefully at that URL, find out what's going on there. Um, if it turns out to be, you know, let's say your 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 aunt Jenny has created a new website to share famous cookie recipe, that's that's something that, that, that they'll realize, okay, this is all right. Um, but if it is malicious activity, it gets categorized uh, based on a whole variety of parameters uh, within uh, Umbrella itself. Um, and then ultimately those, those categories are present within uh, the dashboards that you'd be looking at for that. What we're doing on, on our side basically is looking across uh, the entire customer base and everything that people um, that are using Umbrella are seeing and are willing to share back with us. It's worth pointing out, uh, it's an opt-in sort of situation. We're not just taking information from customers and willy-nil. Um, we're ultimately making sure that it's it's something that they've agreed to do. So it's opt-in to start. So then we're looking at that sort of data um, from all that, that customer base that's sharing with us uh, and collectively bringing that together to, um, to ultimately see what sort of larger trends we're seeing across uh, our customer base, which gives, given its size, gives us a kind of a good representation of what we see in the larger threat landscape. Right, right. And can you talk a little bit about what trends you did see? And was there anything that really jumped out to you and surprised you um, in your different findings from the report? Yeah, actually, there were a couple of really interesting things that I saw. Um, and um, it, it gave us some, some time to kind of look at this and sort of see some behavior that we're seeing from particular in particular areas of the threat landscape. Probably the first one I'd bring up that was the most interesting, I thought, um, had to do with information stealers. Now, information stealers was our uh, most active category this time around when we were looking at, at threat landscape uh, related activity on the DNS side. Um, and that probably doesn't come as too much of a surprise if you, you stop to think about how much activity or the way that, that information stealers um, would use an internet connection. Ultimately, you know, uh, you'd have a bad actor that's going in there and they are getting into an environment and then they're trying to find this, you know, PII or, or um, trade secret information, whatnot, um, and trying to steal that. So ultimately what you're talking about then is a lot of uh, DNS activity as they attempt to exfiltrate those secrets or, or, or information that they're stealing from an organization. Um, so it is a little bit noisy. On top of that, we also categorize, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we categorize uh, things like audio and video related threats that might be listening in on, say, conference calls or, um, say, WebEx calls or something along those lines. Um, those are the sort of things that uh, would fall into this classification too. And so that would also have a, a large amount of DNS activity. So information stealers were the most prevalent. But what was really interesting about that was that we noticed activity, a, a pattern fall within this activity. We would see about three months of above average activity, given the way that we were looking at this data, followed by one month where it was below average for, for one month. Then next three months, it was above average again, and then the following month below average. So what we kind of theorize is happening in this case is 
we what the, these bad actors, what they're probably doing is get, going out there, gathering as much information as they can for three month periods. But, you know, that's that's it's one thing to gather that information. Right. It's, it's another thing to actually find that useful stuff that's in there. So what we think they're actually doing is three months of gathering and then they kind of dial back a bit. They don't drop their activity entirely for the month, but they d- dial it back a bit and maybe examine what they've already gathered for a month. So what you're talking about and three months of gathering one month of basically sifting through all that gathered information and then they go back at it for another three months and then take another month to to dial it back and look at what they have. That's a, that's a really interesting trend because I feel like it gives us a glimpse too of what's going on on the threat actor side of things. And that was one big part of the report that I thought was particularly fascinating was that you can make these potential like correlations between the different data trends. And like, for instance, you noted about the majority of backdoor activity being, um, you know, observed could be attributed to cobalt, cobalt straight, but then you saw a, a spike of activity in October that coincided with a similar spike with um, rat activity. And that, spike could be attributed potentially to the release of a new version of cobalt strike. How do you come up with these different, like, how do you look at these different patterns and say, what's really going on here behind the scenes and kind of between the lines? Because I really think both those examples give us a lot of insight into what's happening in the threat landscape. And that's really important for defenders. Yeah, there's, there's a certain amount of looking at data and then trying to correlate it with what's happening um, from anything from news articles to, uh, social media related activity, what people out there, uh, researchers are talking about um, and trying to see if there's something that correlates. Um, this is really, there's a lot of interesting things that we can kind of um, make educated guesses about what's actually happening out there. But one of the goals that I personally have with a lot of this is to extend this even further and try to figure out more specifically tying, you know, spikes to particular, you know, set activities, um, just like it is with Cobalt Strike. That's one of the easier ones to make a a connection because you see the cobalt strike official um you know uh, um software coming out with a, a new release uh and sh- lo and behold there's more activity around that shortly thereafter um so ultimately uh, it's it's neat to be able to tie more of those together as we go through um another interesting one that we saw was uh um correlations between different categories entirely um one of those being um ransomware and droppers. So when you look at the pattern we would see month on month for ransomware and you compare it to droppers, there were almost mirror images of each other. Uh, very little difference in, or very little change, I should say, between the two charts. Um, and that seems pretty obvious that what you're probably seeing in that case is bad actors using droppers to, you know, getting them out there in networks and then attempting to seed ransomware through those droppers. Yeah, that's really interesting too, because that gives an insight about, you know, how ransomware is being spread, which, you know, we, we, we know that is through droppers, but this kind of, you know, signifies kind of how that really works in, in real time in the threat landscape. Um, yeah. Were there other patterns that you noticed over time that really stood out to you? Yeah, there was, yeah, there was one other that really uh, caught me there and it ties in back to these droppers and ransomware. And that's that we had a direct correlation between those two. But however, when we looked at Trojans, we actually seemed to see a reverse correlation in that during the time frame as a whole, ultimately, these ransomware and droppers had low activity in the first part and then high activity at the end. What we saw was the opposite with Trojans, where it was high activity at the beginning and low at the end. And what we believe is happening in this case is that the Trojans are being used as a step prior to the droppers. They're, they're using a variety of different Trojans. It's a very large category. Uh, it was actually our second highest uh, activity uh, as far as uh, the, all the different categories we saw. Um, but there's, you know how Trojans are. They're kind of like a, a Swiss army knife of, of malicious code, if you will. You know, they, they can do all sorts of things. So they're a real useful tool for getting in there, compromising an organization, um, lateral movement, uh, basically getting, you know, backdoor connections set up, reverse shells, et cetera, um, and being able to take over those networks. Then what the threat actor would end up doing is using the droppers, seeding those droppers perhaps through a Trojan, and then using those droppers to get the ransomware payload. So what we're seeing is a lot of activity early on with those Trojans 
as they take over that network, followed by a drop in Trojan activity as droppers and ransomware uh, in increases in activity. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, too, because it goes to show, you know, when there's a threat campaign or threat activity, they're not just, you know, deploying one malware, like sometimes they'll use a payload for lateral movement, and then they'll have like there's an info stealer that's dropped. And there's a diff a bunch of different components to every single threat attack. So I think that reflects that really well. Yeah. And in the report, we talk about some of these different categories as well, because there'd be DNS activity behind a lot of them. So we're able to to monitor that and see when they increase and when they decrease. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, when you're looking at the report, um, are there any kind of takeaways there for businesses that are looking to defend against these types of threats? What did you find specifically in that area? So yes, there are, there are a variety of things that they can do to, to protect against threats like this. Um, probably the, the, the most obvious, given what the subject matter we're talking about here, uh, is to implement DNS filtering, uh, you know, to use uh, various filtering services to block access to malo known malicious domains and IP addresses. Um, but then also, you know, leverage threat intelligence um, to be able to um, basically keep up on the latest malicious hosts. Um, you really want to stay up to date on that sort of um, lists. They change all the time. So threat intelligence around malicious DNS security, that's, oh, excuse me, around malicious uh sites and using DNS security to block them, uh, it can be a really um, helpful way to go about stopping that. Um, and then ultimately, it just comes down to monitoring that DNS traffic, you know, keep an eye on those logs uh, on the DNS side, um, and look out for malicious patterns and uh, various things that could indicate malicious activity within your, your network. Great, cool. Well, Ben, thank you so much for coming on today. It was um, really great talking to you. And I encourage all of our listeners or viewers to go check out Cisco's Cyber Threat Trends Report. Um, lots of really unique takeaways as Ben is you know, describing here. And um, I think it's a really cool report. So thanks so much, Ben. Great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you.